So I think let's just go ahead and get started. Jessica, that sounds That good. sounds great. Welcome to Triton Transfer Day. We are excited that you're here. We hope uh, we'll give you a little bit of an overview of nanoengineering and answer any questions that you may have. Um, please feel free to message me any questions. We can address questions later on as well. Um, so again, welcome and we're very lucky to have Jesse Jokester here with us, who is a faculty member in the nanoengineering department. So welcome and thank you. Great, thank you, Jessica. Um, so my name is Jesse Jokerst. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Nanoengineering. Um, just a little bit about my background. Um, I originally trained as a chemist. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I then trained in radiology at Stanford and was at Stanford for several years and then have now been at UCSD since 2015. And so um, my research works on imaging and using nanomaterials uh, to increase the signal and the contrast in different kinds of imaging, particularly um, acoustics-based imaging like ultrasound. So um, here's my email address. Feel free to take a screenshot of this or take a picture. Um, I'm always happy to uh, answer any questions about the department. Um, and if I don't know the answer, I'm also happy to, to connect you to someone who might know. Um, so just to address, you know, the elephant in the room, this is a picture of the sign that I had to put on my lab door when we closed the lab down for uh, COVID-19. Uh, that was, I guess, the third week of March, March 15, 16, 17. And it was heartbreaking. Um, it, it really was a bummer, um, not just for me and for the projects that are going on in the lab, but for all the trainees in the group. And in particular, um, there are um, several undergraduates in this picture, uh, Jason Chang, um, Ryan Wing, Jason Tsuchimoto. These are all nano engineering undergraduates who had very active projects in my group and who unfortunately cannot really continue them at this time. So, you know, you probably have several questions um, like what are classes going to be like in the fall? What's housing going to be like? Will I be roomed in singles and doubles? What about the lab courses versus um, the lecture courses? And I wish I could give you answers to these, um, but I can tell you that no one at UCSD has the full answer to this right now uh, because this is moving very quickly and it's changing very quickly. And we all hope that it's going to be back to normal um, this fall, but we just don't know. I can tell you that uh, the campus leadership just announced uh, a very ambitious, if you search for UCSD return to learn, that's return to learn, uh, they're documenting how they're going to ramp up testing on campus so that um, on a routine basis, um, a large majority of students, faculty, staff will be tested for COVID-19 to, to push to move the campus open. So what I, rather than getting stuck in these kind of detail questions, I encourage you to think over the next, you know, as you think about this summer going into the fall, more about who do I want to meet, what do I want to experience, and what do I want to learn, okay? The details have a way of working themselves out, but these are some of the more big picture questions that, that um, should be motivating you and I think um, you know, the department is set up to help you with. So why nanoengineering? Um, you know, I got interested in nanoengineering because of the incredible power that nanoparticles have relative to other kinds of materials. So nanomaterials have been existing in nature for a long time. So this is the foot of a gecko. And the foot of a gecko has these very unique nano, part, nano uh, structures that help it stick to a variety of materials. In the middle here, the, the Lysurgis cup. Um, this is a cup that has very tiny gold nanoparticles into it. And this was 
created thousands of years ago in ancient Rome. So humans have been using these materials and nature has been using these kinds of design principles for, for quite a while. But now in our society, where is nano being used? Well, it's being used in things like computer processing chips, carbon nanotubes up here on the top right, and then at the very top, these different um, quantum dots, these different glowing materials that have a color that's dependent on their size. And so these are now routinely used in computer television displays, computer chips use this all the time. So we believe based on the evidence that the future of many different fields, medicine, energy, catalysis, sensing, as a strong foundation in uh, nanoscale control and nanoscale materials. So just to refresh you, where are we talking about? So if a, a tennis ball is several centimeters and a human hair is several microns, so we're working down here around 10 to the ninth nanometers. So basically something that's the size of the, the coronavirus. And so very, very small material. And so nature, of course, has been doing this for a while, but now human beings can routinely and reproducibly make materials that have this sort of size regime. And as a result of this, a lot of times we take inspiration from nature, such as uh, sea spray, Vicky Grossian in our department, um, studies how nanomaterial sea foam affects the environment. Um, we also look at a number of things like colloids, and that's related to, to milk is essentially a colloid, paint is a colloid, but all of these natural inspirations and other non-inspirations um, uh, is what kind of guide our research and guide the curriculum that uh, we are building. So the department right now kind of has uh, several, several thrusts. Uh, we're, we're a diverse group of faculty and in, in terms of our research, there's a large bin focused on medicine a large bin, probably a third focused on renewable energy, so better batteries, better photovoltaics. Um, maybe another sixth of the department working on computing chips, computer processors, and then another large uh, segment on flexible electronics, flexible sensing, um, and uh, kind of next generation sensing. Um, so, we see this demand continue to, to increase. Um, the department currently has around 200 students. <clears throat> any, any given class is around 40 to 60 students. Um, last year, my senior capstone class um, was, was right at 65. So um, a, a solid number, not so big that you won't get to know the people in your major, but not so small that you know, you, you're not gonna be able to meet a lot of uh, really quality colleagues and, and uh, colleagues for life, really. So um, where we see our students um, going into um, both industry, government jobs, as well as a large uh, component that go into uh, graduate school and at, at really great programs, Columbia, Georgia Tech, MIT. Stanford. Um, so, you know, there's, we have students that go both directions, both in terms of directly to industry and directly um, to graduate school. Um, so yeah, so if you do want to go directly to a BS job, where are these? Well, you know, if, if things that you generally are governing materials properties, because that's what nano essentially is, is we're controlling how does matter how does the behavior of matter change when you change the dimensions, right? So if you take a big chunk of gold, it doesn't, it, it isn't uh, green, right? But as you make gold smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, all of a sudden it starts to look green, right? That's pretty remarkable. And if you change the dimensions a little bit, you can make it appear blue, right? So that's just a very simple example of how the material properties of something change dramatically when it goes from big to small. So who cares about that? Well, people who make polymers, people who make composites, um, again, people who are making alternative energy sources. You know how much nano is in a, a solar panel? A lot. You know how much nano is in a battery? A lot. Do you know how much nano is in a computer chip? A lot. And so um, that's, that's where our people tend to go. 
an eye out for this wearable sensing. So Fitbit probably set a great precedent for a company that made a lot of money, has a great product. And um, so there's a lot of startup funding in this wearable sensing space. So Fitbit was really easy. It was just an accelerometer that counted steps. And now uh, we're starting to sense things like glucose is another really obvious one, but like cortisol. So how stressed is a soldier? So we've got wearable sensors in the department that is sensing cortisol or heparin, which is an anticoagulant. Um, how quickly does your blood clot? Can we do that with wearable sensing? Um, you know, more traditional industries, paints, coatings, toothpastes, uh, consumer products, sunscreen, um, textiles, and then of course medicine. We have a lot of people working on next generation drug delivery, uh, next generation stem cell scaffolds, and then I guess my work is uh, kind of next generation imaging contrast agents. So um, a lot of different sectors tend to pick up our graduates. So thinking about um, the degree requirements and so um, where you are in this circle as transfer students kind of depends on, um, you know, your unique situation. Um, but there's, of course, the general education um, component, which varies by college. So this is kind of confusing. UCSD is a university, but within that we have several colleges. So we have Ravel College and Roosevelt College and Sixth College and Warren College. And so these are kind of modeled after the UK model, like at Cambridge or Oxford, where there will be little colleges within the university. And so the students primarily identify with that college and they have slightly different degree requirements. So it makes it complicated, but no worries because we have a large um, um, group of student advisors who can help you with this. So you need, you'll know your general education. You'll have engineering prep courses, which almost always will come from your, uh, your transfer curriculum. Core curriculum, which also a lot of this will transfer. Basic science up here at the very top, um, a lot of that will transfer. The nano electives, probably not. So that's what you'll look at for the, a lot of the next couple years. Um, so you'll take introductory courses, chemistry, physics, maths. Again, a lot of this will transfer um, bioengineering, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, material science. These are some of the other areas of electives that you, you will take. Um, so the first year at UCSD, um, these are some of the, the, the core courses that you will be required to take. Um, you know, you, there is some room here for general electives, some room for nano electives. Um, um, I'm sorry, GE is general education, not general elective. Um, but nano 102, that's a core course. Um, that's um, the chemical principles of nano engineering. I've taught that um, before. Andrea Tao tends to teach it now. Uh, nano 4 is a great class that is uh, your first lab-based course. So right off the bat, you're going to be making nanoparticles in the lab. Then the second year, uh, Nano 119, you're going to be starting to characterize these materials. We have a scanning electron microscope that our students use. Um, Nano 120A then, the following winter, this is when you start to uh, do more of a bigger design project. So um, you're going to be making silica particles, gold particles, um, and then you're going to be using them for some kind of application. So whether it's uh, for an energy storage device or for a, a medical contrast agent. Um, and then the rest of your, your curriculum um, flows from there. So uh, these are taught by, by real leaders in the field, um, people who are internationally recognized and um, are very research active, but of course are 100% um, dedicated to, to teaching. Um, so some more of these courses. So 102, I talked about the chemical principles. 103 is the physical principles. Um, you'll, we have a strong emphasis on modeling. And so uh, primarily we use MATLAB and Python, and this will help you learn about how we can save time basically by modeling how a nanoparticle behaves before uh, we go into the lab and build it. Characterization is key. So again, uh, electron microscopes, um, different kinds of chromatography, um, and then synthesis and fabrication. And then these two, Nano 120A and Nano 120B, are kind of the capstone experiences. And um, 
So again, 120A, we're giving you kind of a cookbook approach to how to make and use your particles. 120B, you're basically given an empty lab and saying, okay, we want you to, um, to, to create a solution uh, to a problem that society has. So what some of the things we're proud about, um, we are relatively new. We just had our 10 year anniversary, but we're still the newest, um, we're still the newest engineering department with, at UCSD. Another thing we're proud of is we just were accredited in 2017. So ABET is the body that accredits um, engineering departments in the United States. So why should you care? Well, you should care because uh, the professional engineering exam is something that you can take one or two years out of school. And once you have passed the professional engineering exam, you tend to get a fairly significant raise. The amount of time you have to wait out of school before you can take this exam is much smaller when you're coming from an accredited department. We're also very unique. So in terms of the training that you're gonna get here, there are very few nano engineering departments um, that offer both undergraduate and graduate degrees. And so um, we're also the oldest. And so we've worked out a lot of kinks in the curriculum. And so um, I, we're, there's really no better place to study this field. Um, and we, we, we continue to think that um, similar to how aerospace engineering in the 60s, computer engineering in the 70s and 80s, and bioengineering in the 90s really had a major impact on industry, we continue to see how nano has that uh, pretty profound impact on industry, and we think that will continue to play forward. We're largely housed in the SME building, so this stands for Structural and Materials Engineering. Uh, the building opened in the beginning part of uh, this decade, so 2011. Um, it's uh, really fantastic. It has this open atrium. My office overlooks the, uh, the, a swimming pool. It's, it's just in a really fantastic part of campus. It's also the new trolley. So there's a new piece of public transportation that's coming into campus. And the, the main campus gateway is right next to this building. So you're at a very enviable part of campus. Your classes may not be in here, but your faculty offices will be in here. If you join a research lab, they'll be in this uh, building as well. So we talked a little bit this, but just briefly, um, this is so important, these senior capstone design courses. Um, these are your, this is our 120A and 120B. Um, this is gonna really help you think about how, how to be a professional engineer. How do you um, think about design requirements? How do you think about cost restrictions? And how do you create a solution? And so really the, the best way to do this is to, is to do it by practice and so um, that's what these are going to do 120a is going to teach you some of the skills uh, computational skills microscopy skills design skills and then 120b is going to let you um, execute this on your own uh, it'll all be done in this dedicated student laboratory so this is brand new space within the last five or six years most of the equipment is new um, and the benches are new. Everything is, is really new. It's a very well-stocked laboratory um, and we're continue to improve it. So I just um, am upgrading a, a, a new um, piece of equipment called dynamic light scattering, which measures the charge of nanoparticles and the size of nanoparticles in solution. So the hydrodynamic radius of the particles. And so that's gonna be a brand new piece of equipment that's coming online. Uh, later this year that you'll have access to. We also offer um, a uh, MSBS program. So these are for students that graduate with a 3.5 GPA or above who want to do a really quick master's. Um, master's degrees have a lot of value in engineering. Um, PhDs, not so much. When I was in the Bay Area, the joke was that in engineering, PhD stood for permanent head damage. And so if you want to go to be a professor, then by all means get a PhD, but most of you probably are not gonna be professors. And so, um, but, a, but an MS is a good way of standing out without all the hassle of a PhD. And this program allows you to do that with just a single additional year of coursework. You also don't have to take the GRE and you don't have to pay the graduate application fee. <clears throat> Excuse me, there's two ways of doing this. One is by writing a master's thesis, and the other one is take, uh, by taking a comprehensive exam. So um, we see a large number of our students do this. 
probably um, about 50% of those that are eligible um, <clears throat> by having a 3.5 GPA. Um, we have a very dedicated faculty. So there's about 30 uh, faculty members full time. Um, we meet regularly with the students. Um, there's in, informal luncheons that are organized on campus. Um, we all have open door policies and regular office hours. So, um, you know, we're easy to get to know if you put in a little bit of effort um, to um, come and, and uh, connect with us. Um, we're, we're always available and of course always available by email. Um, so other opportunities in it for career development, um, there's several student organizations. NETS is the, the undergraduate organization um, focused on nanoengineering students. Our department also hosts the chemical engineering program. And so um, they're also um, have a large student organization that bring in panels from industry to facilitate networking, resume workshops, panels on graduate students in industry. So um, this is a way for you to, to meet people beyond what is beyond the faculty, right? You, you'll, you'll have plenty of time to interact with us in the classroom, but uh, we like to give you the opportunity to meet business leaders in the community, uh, civic leaders, and so these sorts of events are, are a key way of doing that. Um, there's the Research Expo on campus. Um, many of our undergraduate students are active in research labs, and so they have projects, and this is how the Research Expo is a chance for them to uh, showcase their work to, to the leaders in the community. We also have a dedicated uh, group of student advisors um, of which Jessica uh, Wynn here is in charge of this uh, office. And so uh, these are folks who can really help you answer questions like, does this course that I'm transferring meet the degree requirements for physics 2D, right? Those kinds of very specific tech technical questions about uh, course transfers, being on course wait lists, maybe there's only so many seats for a course, how do you, how do you work the system there? You'll also want to periodically do um, a degree audit, meaning have I, uh, am I fulfilling all the degree requirements in order to graduate on time? They're also a shoulder to cry on when you're, when you're losing it. I mean, of course we have um, a, a dedicated uh, campus counseling service but um, you know the, the graduate advisors, or I'm sorry, the student advisors know the details about the pro, the department and the degree program um, in in fine detail. So so it can be actually quite helpful. I really encourage you to take uh, advantage of them. So going back to these big picture questions, who do I want to meet? What do I want to experience? What do I want to learn? I think that you know, the Department of Nanoengineering is really set up to help you meet some of the smartest and most talented people um, that are in this field. There's no end to what you can accomplish at the University of California. The, the amount of expertise, the amount of resources, and the amount of specialized equipment that we have is really unrivaled. And so I wanna congratulate you on, on being admitted to the program. And I want you to think about what do you want to experience and what do you want to learn? Because you have a lot of opportunity. And um, although it may sound like a lot of time, two or three years is not a lot of time. I also wanna acknowledge that, you know, there's probably a lot of uncertainty around this uh, coronavirus and COVID-19. And, you know, if we think about your life and you've you've started it, it's got an end, it's got a middle, and somewhere in here is a little bit of time at university. So you may be tempted to sort of change your plans based on COVID-19. So you might wanna think, you could be thinking about, well, maybe I do a gap year, but you can't really go anywhere, all the borders are closed. Should I just stick it out at community college, maybe do some more credits? Well, it's really not, not gonna be the same if you're transferring, there's really not very many uh, courses that you probably left can take. Do you just go get a job? Well, jobs are pretty hard to find right now. The country just lost about 30 million jobs over the last six weeks. Do nothing, well, you don't wanna, you don't wanna waste your time, right? 
So I really encourage you to not make a short-term decision based on fear that's gonna have lifelong negative consequences, right? This is, this COVID-19 will pass and uh, life will come back to normal and you wanna be at a place that is set up to help you learn the things that will make your career successful and meet the people that will make your career successful. So just some other pieces of unsolicited advice is to work hard. Grades matter. Grades matter even when you're looking for jobs, even when you're looking at graduate school. And they matter because they're an indicator of attention to detail and hard work. I look at GPA a lot when I take new graduate students because of those two, those two factors. They, they indicate hard work and attention to detail. Start with the end in mind. I mean, what I mean by that is that you're the master of your own fate. So if your goal is to start a nanoparticle factory, then tell your professors that you wanna start a nanoparticle factory and we'll help you do that. If your goal is to become a clinical trial physician, we'll help you do that. But if the answer is generally, I don't know what I wanna do, we have sympathy for that because I was an I don't know what I want to do person for a long time, but it's harder to, to put all the pieces together if you don't have a clear end in mind. Work on building your network. Um, again, you're going to meet not just faculty, but also other really, really bright students, other really, really bright graduate students. And these are people who you will take with you for the rest of your life. So really, um, take the time to, to get to know them. Uh, turn off your phone, pay attention in class, um, minimize screen time as much as you can, and then also have fun, right? I mean, it's college, it's supposed to be pretty fun. Um, you're in Southern California, so um, take a minute and uh, don't spend it all <laughs> um, hunkered over books. So with that, I'll just close with a quote from Richard Feynman, who um, was one of the faculty who really kind of uh, got the ball rolling on nano decades ago, and he said, there's plenty of room at the bottom, meaning that there's, there's lots of uh, study to be done on, on this nanoscale regime. And so this was our vision on how to help you get to the top of that. I include my email address here at the lower left, again, if you'd like to reach out, um, and happy to take any questions. Yes, please let us know if you have any questions. Um, I also just wanted to add that, yes, please come to um, us advisors. If you have any question on campus, we can always put you in touch in the, uh, with resources. We can direct you where you need to go. It's always a great way to start uh, with the advisor if you're, not if you're not sure where to go. I also provided you with the email, I mean, with the website, and I also will give you the email, but please let me know if you, or uh, have any question, questions for Jesse about Nano, we'll be happy to answer them right now. So let us know, don't be shy. <laughs> You can either unmute your phone. Uh, if you have a question, you can, I sh maybe I should have uh, included it. If you have a question, you can either use the chat option or if you're familiar with the raise your hand option, then you can raise your hand too. There is a button for that. So those are your options currently, whichever you prefer. And we'll just hang out <laughs> for a few minutes. Okay, well, hearing none, um, we're, we're again, we're excited to have you join us and um, feel free if as other questions or issues come up, um, we're happy to help you um, make the next right step. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. Jessica, thanks for all your help. Yes, thank you for hosting this event for us. I really appreciate it and a lot of yeah. good information in there. I hope it was helpful for everyone too. Great, okay, have a good afternoon. Bye. Thank you.